Today we're going to learn how to program realistic MIDI drums. Hi, I'm Mike and I hope you're well. What do you call a drummer without a girlfriend? Answers in the comments below. Now we are going to be talking drums today and we're specifically going to be talking about how to program realistic MIDI drums in your home studio in your door. Now there's a few videos out there on this subject and a lot of them talk about writing drum grooves but we're going to be looking at this from the perspective of a singer songwriter. So we're not only going to be looking at the technical aspects of this, we're going to be looking at the musical considerations you're going to make when you go through this process. Now if you like this kind of content and this is the kind of content I create all the time then please do like and subscribe subscribe, share it with your friends. I'll be glad of your company. Let's dive in. One. So step one is about making some basic choices about the drum sounds you're going to use. Now this is going to depend on which plugin you're using. It might be Easy Drummer, Addictive Drums, BFD or Superior Drummer. They all have a range of kits available. Today I'm going to be using Superior Drummer 3, but let me know in the comments what your favourite plugin is. Now although we'll be writing our drum parts from scratch, I sometimes find it's going to be useful if you load in a groove to audition the kit. So let's have a listen. Okay, it's not too bad, but this snare drum is really ringy. So I'm just going to swap it out for something I know has got a little bit more crack to it. I'll go the Ludwig Black. Here we go. Let's have another listen. Okay, that's much, much better. So you can go through this process and choose and swap out different drums on your kit. Now, you're not committed, you can always change it later, but it will just give you a rough starting point. Two. The next step is to record a guide instrument part. This might be a guitar or piano, for example. This is going to help you in several ways. Firstly, it gives you the basic rhythm and tempo, and it also gives you a sense of dynamics and the soft and loud parts of the song. It'll also help you keep track of where you are, verse, chorus, etc. I do stress, though, that this should only be a guide. You shouldn't put too much effort and time into this. It may well be that you'll change that instrument part later as your arrangement develops. For this make-believe song, I've just recorded what I'll call a verse and middle part. Have a listen. Now that part is already suggesting a number of drum parts. Can you hear the chop on the second beat? That's definitely a snare drum right there. It's those kind of things you want to be listening to at the beginning when you've got your basic instrument part. Three. In this step, we'll be setting up for recording the drums. Now, I prefer to do this on several MIDI tracks, one for the hi-hat and cymbals, one for the kick and snare, and another one for the toms. This is just a really good way to keep organised. Now, I use my controller keyboard to play the drums. You could also use pads or an electronic kit. As a last resort, you can manually put each note in. The biggest problem with that is that you're going to be very tempted to copy and paste large sections, and that's going to take away from any realism. Now this is where my workflow di may differ from others. Firstly, I don't play the whole kit at once. Instead, I record hi-hat and cymbals, kick and snare, followed by drums. I find I get a finer control over velocity this way, and velocity is really important in getting your drums to sound realistic. Secondly, I don't record short parts and then copy and paste them. Instead, I record the whole song from beginning to end and tidy up the mistakes manually. This way I'm responding in my playing to the song dynamics overall. Four. Now unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately for you, my computer won't seem to let me record myself recording each drum part and record the screen at the same time. So you don't get to tediously listen to me put in, for example, a hi-hat part. However, I have kept the original recordings that I've done so you can see how I edit them. Here's the hi-hat part. Now I can already see that this is not in particularly good shape. Several of the notes are not quite close enough to the bars or the beats. So I'm going to want to quantize it. But before I do, I'm really wanting to 
going to want to know what kind of a structure this beat has, whether it's simple time or compound time. Now, if you're not sure what those things are, that's okay, because I've made a video about simple and compound time. And I urge you to watch it, because it can really help you out when you're trying to figure out which quantize settings you're supposed to be using for your song. So I'll put a link to that in the description, and you should be able to click somewhere at the moment for that, or watch at the end of the video. Now, I happen to know that this song is in compound time, and that there are six inner beats to each beat. So I'm gonna to have to change the quantize settings to 116T here in Studio One. And then if I hit Q for quantize, we see that my hi-hat is tidied up. Now you say, why are you quantizing? That's gonna take the humanity out of it. And that's true. And sometimes I go in afterwards and I adjust each note manually. But my rule is this, I don't mind quantizing all of the drums as long as I don't also quantize all of the other instruments as well. For example, if I quantize the drums and the piano and the bass, the whole thing starts to sound a little mechanical. Whereas if I quantize the drums, but leave those things untouched, then I generally find that you get a good result. So let's have a listen to that hi-hat. Okay, so the great thing is when you play it in manually from a keyboard is you get these natural variations in velocities. And that's really, really important when you're trying to get a human kind of a feel. Now, we haven't really finished with that hi-hat yet, and we need to put some cymbals in. But first of all, let's move on to the kick and snare. So here is the kick and snare. And again, I can see that it probably needs to be quantized. So I'll just click Q on that again and you can see there's some adjustments have been made. Now, sometimes with the best will in the world, the computer just gets it wrong and you have to go through and manually adjust some notes here and there. But I think it's done okay on this occasion, so let's have a listen. So we're off to a good start. I want you to have a listen again and see how the bass drum and the snare are playing against the guitar part. So the bass and the snare are kind of mimicking what's going on in the guitar. Now that doesn't always happen. Sometimes the guitar part's much more straightforward and it depends on the player. But on this occasion, you could really hear that bass and snare in the original part. Five. Okay, we're off to a good start, but it still all sounds a little mechanical. Also, that hi-hat's a little bit tedious running all the way through from beginning to end. So I'm going to show you a couple of variations. First of all, in the verse part, I'm going to occasionally use an open hi-hat to accentuate what the guitar is doing. And second of all, in the middle section, I'm going to swap from hi-hat to a ride cymbal, which gives a much broader, expansive sound to the whole kit. So have a listen out for those two things. And here comes the ride cymbal. Okay, so you can already hear some really nice dynamic changes there, especially when it changes from hi-hat to ride cymbal. You don't want to do it in all of your songs, and all of these rules are designed to be broken, but it's definitely a go-to technique, and it's something that real drummers do quite a bit. Six. The next thing I like to do is add any ghost notes or flams to the snare where I think it's suitable. What are ghost notes? Ghost notes are notes which are there but are a lot less volume than the other notes around them or sometimes even barely audible. Let's have a listen to our first bar which hasn't got any ghost or flam notes. Okay, so I'm gonna pop a ghost note just in at the end of the bar here. I'll pop it in here, obviously reduce its velocity all the way down, all the way down to there, and let's have a listen with that note in there.
Okay, so it's only just there, and that one adds a, just a little skip to the end of the bar. Okay, let's try it with a flam. A flam is where there are two notes really, really close together of a much more equal volume. We'll just shift this one back here, and we'll pop it in just before this note here. And we'll pop the volume or the velocity up. Not the same, but much louder than we use for the ghost note. Let's have a listen to that. Okay, so you get this really quick succession of notes, one after the other, and that's called a flam. And that can all add to the humanity of the piece. One tip is though, don't do your flams until you're happy that all of your quantizing is done. Because once you quantize the piece with flams, then they're all gonna disappear. Seven. The next thing I like to do is add some cymbals. Now cymbals are a really good way to accent certain beats in the song. And they're also good as kind of musical markers to denote the end or the beginning of sections. And that's a simple way that I'm gonna use them here. So right at the beginning where the first verse starts, I'm gonna move this hi-hat up to a crash cymbal sound. Then I'm gonna to move to where the middle section begins and I'm gonna move this first ride symbol here to a crash symbol. And also, just after that middle section is ended and we go into the next section, I'm gonna move this hi-hat up to a crash symbol. Okay, we'll quantize all of that and we'll have a listen. Eight. Next we'll be looking at drum fills. Now drum fills are excellent musical tools and they're often used to take us from one section into another. They can be done on tom-toms or they could be done on a snare, a snare and a kick, any of those combinations. Some styles of music hardly use tom-tom fills and just stick to the snare and the kick drum. In this example, I'll be using a combination of both. I've got a kick and snare lead in at the beginning of the song and I've also got a tom-tom fill in the middle and a tom-tom fill at the end. Let's Let's have a listen to the drums by themselves and let's start with the pickup at the beginning. That really helps to kind of ease the drums in without them suddenly coming in abruptly. Then leading into the middle section we've got a tom-tom feel. Again, nothing really, really complex, but it just kind of fits in with what the existing guitar is already doing there. Nine. Okay, so at this stage, you've got all of your basic components in place with your drums. I wouldn't do too much more until you record some other instruments. Then you can begin to craft your drums around those instruments or vice versa. Now one instrument which is often mentioned in terms of working with the drums is the bass guitar. And it is really important that you get these two to work together. That doesn't mean they always play exactly the same notes or exactly the same timing as each other. It's more that they consider each other. Now I've recorded a bass guitar part to fit in with this drum beat. In some parts, the bass guitar is locking in, especially with the bass drum. But I'm also using the length of the bass notes to emphasize when the snare drum kicks in. So let's have a listen to just the bass and the drums by themselves and you'll see what I mean. Ten. So we've done a lot here and by this time you should be building out your drum track really nicely. Now as you add more instruments you're going to want to control the mix of the drums quite finely. Most of these drum plugins do come with some kind of a mixer and they're really really good, they're useful. And so I usually develop my ideas with the drums just going out to a stereo track on the mixer. But at some stage later when I come to actually mixing, I like to output each individual drum and the overheads to an individual track in my mixer. That helps me get really good control over the drums in the place where I need it where I'm mixing. It also enables me to easily add individual ones of my favourite effects to individual drums. So there you have it, I hope that was of benefit to you. There's probably a hundred different ways of achieving the same result. So if you've got a different way of programming your drums to your songs, then please talk about it in the comments below. We can always learn more, I can always learn more. I'd love to hear from you. If you like this, please like and subscribe, share it with your friends, tell other people about it. I'm loving your company and please do take care and I'll see you next week.